That's the WTIC me Channel 3, Hartford, Connecticut, and it's time now for the 6 p.m. report for this. Saturday evening, September 12th, 1970. Good evening, everybody. I'm Peter Wiggins. There is what's happening. A pall of smoke rolls over the Jordan Desert today, and Arab girls said that they had blown up three hijacked planes that removed their passengers. They claimed that it was on their first step to the warning to Western governments to meet their demands. They had said that previously that the planes would be destroyed within the passengers aboard unless Britain, Switzerland, and West Germany released their seven Arab commandos in their custody. The three jetliners are Transworld Airliners Born 707, a Swiss Air DC-8, and a British Overseas Airways Corporation VC-10 were blown up at 3.15 p.m. Jordan Thomas, spokesman for the Popular Front for the Liberal Liberation of Palestine, said this was 9.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. He added that it was a first step of a warning following a delay of three Western governments to concede their own terms. The planes were worth a total of $25 million. The destruction would be raised to close to $50 million of the aircraft losses since the front began to have air piracy and event activities on last Sunday. At the time, a Pan American World Airways 747 a jumbo jet worth $34 million in cash was blown up in Cairo after being hijacked there and releasing its passengers. Witnesses reported on the blast in Jordan said that it was created by shot and end shots fired in the air by guerrillas. Smoke from the airstrip, heavy and black in the clear blue sky, was visible 20 to 30 miles away. Jordanian troops had pulled back 15 minutes and 15 miles from the airstrip, which was scaled off after removal of the less passengers. Guerrilla sources stated categorically that there was no loss of life in the explosion. They said that all Israeli men among the passengers have been removed in a special hotel outside of Amman. About approximately 240 passengers were on the planes of the Friday night. Originally, there had been 400 passengers, passengers and crewmen. On the three planes from time to time, various parties have been removed since their arrival on the desert strip. The planes have been guarded constantly of scores of late. And no bigger than 12 right Thomas Ray fought of death in the desert and he clutched his chest again, remembering the air that was so hard to breathe. The five days in a hijacked plane when we would have hoped that America would be do something to get us out of there. Regero 39 Labyrinth from Knoxville, Tennessee, and his wife Norma were free today, released by guerrilla hijackers because Ruggiero's heart condition made them nervous. He was an almost dead man by the grills did not want. Timid and soft spoken, Ruggiero said he had felt much better after a visit to the doctor, but he recalled being taken out of the hijacked Transworld Air Lines jet for auction when the breath grew short. I prayed, he said. Yes, I prayed. The passengers kept their terror to themselves, he said. Outwardly, most people were fairly calm. They realized after the initial shock of the hijack what the situation was. The guerrillas, or whatever you call them, were the most friendly when they came on board. They even complied with some of the passengers' requests. Specifically, Ruggiero said that the guerrillas were asked not to carry their weapons on board because they are scared of the children. They kept coming in like tourists, you know, he said. Many of them were probably never on an airplane before, and when we asked them to stop coming in, they did stop. Ruggiero felt bad for the Jewish passengers. Most of them were frightened, understandably, he said. The guerrillas had gone fat the luggage and had found that many had more than one passport, American and Israeli. They confiscated everything that was made in Israel or the world is really on it. Wigero said that it was political indication that sessions in which the grills tried to. In Washington, the next administration intends to continue its feminization program and to reduce American military forces elsewhere in Asia, but more money is needed to do the job that the House of Representatives was voted Secretary of the State. Willem P. Rogers said today in front of the Senate committee and Senate subcommittee. Testifying for Senate Appropriations Subcommittee, Rogers urged that the Senate restore funds cut by the House from the administration budget request for foreign and economic and military aid. Rogers said that it was prepared statement that went that the administration is encouraging more self-reliance on the part of other nations. It's particularly important that we would not withdraw, or even to appear to withdraw from our world and the world. We are deliberately lowering our military presence in the Asian nations, Rogers said, as those countries undertake their own defenses and all but major con contingencies. The administration's program is one of readjustment, which may well mean increased military supplies and increased economic relationships, he said. Rogers urged that the Senate subcommittee to restore the bill to the 
832 million dollars cut by the House on the administration's 1.8 billion dollar economic aid request by the present fiscal year. The House action cripples on the entire program, he said. In Brownsville, Texas, Hurricane Alice smashed into a thinly settled area of northeastern Mexico today with winds top at 125 miles per hour and torrential rains. Communications failed and there were no immediate word of how residents fared in the fishing village of La Pesca where the storm pressed ashore from the Gulf of Mexico between 6 a.m. and Playing tonight on Thursday Night Football, which is the home opener for the Patriots, and they have two very memorable 7 p.m. Thursday nights. And this is La Pesca, Mexico. Here, yeah. the Tom Brady list found themselves in a shootout with Brent Favre and the Jets, despite spectacular touchdown catch by Randy Moss. The Jets battle back. La Pesca is a community of small houses with thatched roofs and many summer cabins. Sits at the mouth of the Rio Soto La Marina. The little town of Soto La Marina is 22 miles inland. Whoever bureau observers who trace the hurricane with radar predicted it would be thrust 50 to 60 miles westward before being itself to death against the Sierra Madre Mountains. Up to 15 inches of rain was predicted today and tonight, and heavy flooding was forecast in the affected area. Tides went to 8 feet as hell across the coastline. Winds, which had exceeded 125 miles per hour in squalls, dropped into 150 miles per hour by 7 a.m. when the wherever bureau discontinued on warnings and hurricane watch out of the Texas coast. At the point, the center of the hurricane was placed at 835 miles south southwest of the Brown near latitude 24.0 and north and longitude 97.9 western crown toward the west at 5 to 10 miles per hour. A typical newsman, Victor Flores, said the Mexican army reported that only communication with the La Pesca and Soto La Marina was by means of an armature radio hookup and they were unable to raise any one in either place but the night. Experts in the Weather Bureau at Brownsville said a wedge of high pressure proved the primary steering force and kept L from swinging north and better in parts of the Texas coast. Instead, the hurricane maintained a westward course and reached land in the same general area where another one named it struck in 1965. At 11 p.m. on Friday, the storm was centered near Latitude 24 North, launched to 97.0 or about 140 miles south southeast of Brownsville. The storm brought grim memories of Hurricane Beulah to residents of the lower Rio Grande Valley and on September 20, 1967, that storm too was going to be a short blow of Brownsville, but at the last minute, she turned her short on Brownsville and plowed up the Rio Grande. As Hurricane Ella moved closer Friday night, storm shelters began to fill with coastal residents fleeing in before the deadly winds and tides. The Texas Department of Public Safety activated its emergency operating center at Alston and a National Guard was put on a standby basis. Elba was moved across the Yucatan Peninsula at Mexico Thursday with winds of 75 miles per hour. Still barely hurricane force. Later she sped the movement at 20 miles per hour, then began slowing down in the forward movement and intensifying her punch. Many refugees moved down to the low line Padre Island during the night. Others moved from Port Isabel to shelters at Harlingen and Rio Grande City. Mobile home residents as far as 50 miles inland were wiring to seek safety as the night wore on highways and roads out of the lower valley filled with refugees included many as you saw Peel as 1967 times and felt their force of her winds. Wounded warriors. Boston bombing survivors are now in that lineup of heroes. Mayor Menino applauded the massive undertaking. Venice, a short lived whirlwind brought destruction and death in Venice suburbs and on the lagoon, finding out when it picked up a crowded passenger boat like a Toothpick spun in the air and broke it in the back into the water where it sank 30 seconds. Five men received 18 bodies and 30 other persons were rescued. The others are approximately 60 absorbed. We're missing? The toll on the land were 12 killed and about 200 injured. Police said, I saw the whirlwind whisk by. The gondolier said, It picked up a motorboat like a toothpick. He held it up in air and threw it like back in the water like a cannonball. But the race continues on for all of these survivors. There wasn't a shout. Nobody had time to realize what, what was going on. I only heard a hang of a metal being twisted as if it were a feather. The survivors included Enzo Billo, the pilot. Fell from the craft when it was in the air. Police said, I tried to steer the wheel away, but I couldn't do it. Thing. Bull said, suddenly I found myself. And you're looking at the light. In midair, the boat plunged into the water under me. I felt it in the lagoon and I looked around for any possible survivors, but I was dazed, half crazy, and I barely managed to get to shore. Our 40s estimated the wind speed at 125 miles per hour. The whirlwind in which it's similar to a tornado splintered in houses and shops and street stands and anticipated over the Gulf of Venice. Electrical power was interrupted at the canal city. Police said damage was confined mainly to the private buildings and a hospital in the soccer stadium and sustained heavy damage. The treasures spared the city's art treasures in St. Mark's Square along the Grand Canal which are 
Dan Tan, the 25 ton motorboard has just pulled on the St. Helena Island off St. Mark's Basin where the wind struck demolishing it. San Diego, California Vice President Spower T. Agnew has declared that any candidate Democrat or Republican who voices radical sentiments or gets radical left wing support should be defeated by the voters in November. And Agnew aide said that the application of the guidelines of candidates of all parties should be establishing the credibility of the voice president's campaign. Assault on politicians he calls radical liberals. In my view, this fall, any candidate to the party who voices radical sentiments or who courts or enjoys the support of radical elements ought to be voted out of the office by the American people. Agnew said Friday night, it's just too dangerous. With that, Agnew demanded that the representative John and V. Tunney, the Democrat nominee against the Senator George Murphy, stand up and re America's cleaning experts for 65 years. Our team goes paint the radicals and extremists nested in the Democratic Party in the state of California. If he refuses to repudiate them, to the end so far, the name people of California should be repudiated. And the vice president told him about entering people at a 125 dollar plate Republican dinner. Tenney in a statement from the Los Angeles headquarters accused Agnew of wild and abusive language. Every time Spire Agnew speaks to give the new dimensions to his own extremism, Tenney said. Spark your kitchen project at New England's ultimate kitchen. School operations were shut down and limited in seven connected communities on Friday as stranded teachers much went to court to talk with school boards, but in one city, Bristol tentative agreement was reached on a new contract. Bristol Mayor Howard J. Norton Jr. announced that agreement today following a four-hour night session with negotiations for the Bristol Education Association and that our agreement is ratified by the Teachers Association at a meeting scheduled for Monday. They will return to the classrooms on Tuesday, Norton said. More funds will have to be appropriated to finance the contract, Norton said, Middleton Town and New London, meanwhile. Schools were closed more today, and in New Haven, West Haven, and Summers, school operations were curtailed. Those were some of the developments on Friday in New Haven. Talks resumed between the school board and the New Haven Federation of Teachers. The talks have been cut short and apparently didn't pass on Thursday and didn't resume until Friday at 7 p.m. The Education Department, meanwhile, announced that on Friday, 20% of the teachers showed up in the middle schools, 24% in high schools, and 50% in elementary schools. And school officials were trying to take up the suck by using volunteers and administrators as teachers. And Stanford teachers went back to the jobs after two days of strike and ratification of a new contract was expected next week. In Middletown, officials of the Middletown Education Association announced that teachers would be to return to school. On Monday, while the question was underway, the announcement came during a Superior Court hearing in which the teachers were to show cause why they shouldn't be held in contempt on a court order brand and a strike. The hearing was continued on Monday. No London teachers in a similar hearing in Norwich. Was denied a move that would be delayed and inherent until next week, and they were denied a move to have an injunction against their strike dissolved. Superior Court Judge David M. Shea told them, I will not consider a motion to modify or dissolve the contempt matter until the teachers go back into work. The hearings resumed today in Milford. The school board agreed to meditation and the teachers will go back to work after State Commissioner of Education William J. Standards offered to help us set up a meditation. <laughs> Senators made a similar effort to the offer strike ban communities then asking strike teachers to go back to work in the interim. The Milford teachers scheduled a meeting Monday morning to so vote on whether to accept the offer. In West Haven, the school board's chief negotiator is Richard L. Her shoulder said the board and Mayor Alexander Zornowski had agreed to negotiate with the teachers. Begin soon, they morning there has been no talk. A voice vote at a request by their leaders that they return to work while talks resume the school board had said a return to work would be a condition for talks. For our friend Chet, fighting medical challenges head on, but nothing stopped mm. him from being there today. Cheshire Man was killed and a 17 man injured when her vehicles collided at 12 to 40 this morning on the Yalesville Road, Route 70 in Cheshire. The Cheshire Man was Alvin A. Durell, 43. <laughs> of 80. Was, yeah, for his 50 years of television was dead on arrival at the Meriden Walford Hospital. Meriden, the 17 man, Jenny B. Jubert, 24 of 250 Sunny Soap Drive, was in fair condition today. At Meriden Walford Hospital. Debron and Jubert were alone in a vehicles, Debron and Van Trek, Jubert. And a 964 Ford was today. 
Cheshire police said that the accident occurred for about 50 feet from the Walford land near the spot where the broad brick reservoir is on both sides of the highway. They spent juvenile. Police said across the center line and collided almost headed on with a westbound to people. The juvenile. For years. On 25 feet after the collision. To west against the highway post, both men were pinned in their vehicles after the collision. The vehicles were demolished. The bar was moved anyway. In the Cheshire ambulance. Sanford H. Wendover retired today as editor of the Merton Journal at the age of 36 after 54 years of social with a newspaper. Wendover came to the journal shortly after graduating from the school of journalism of Columbia University. His first position was that of telegraph editor. It was um, four years later to be um, advertiser, manager, and was in charge. Advertiser, 25 years and 43, became editor. In 1949, when the Meriden Record Company purchased a journal, Wendover was president, was secretary of journal publishing. Company he was invited to as editor under the change of ownership and has been ever title ever since. Springfield Police culminated about two months of investigation yesterday when they arrested about 14 alleged heron pushers in the Winchester Square area. Captain Robinay, head of the Crime Prevention Bureau that led the raid, which landed the alleged pushers and several hundred dollars worth of heroin. Miffin termed the arrest the largest of heroin in Springfield history. Miffin said that in addition for the 12 arrests yesterday for a warrant, uh, the sale of heroin and possession of heroin were lodged at the Hampton County House of Correction against four men jailed there. CB officials started their sweep early yesterday morning and their arrest of three persons. Miffin said the Bureau and Ross undercover intelligence officers and obtained the evidence against those arrested and said all arrested were charged with possession of heroin and sell the heroin. Memphis said he obtained the warrants in Springfield District Court Thursday and that the Bureau has served more to serve the press press court. Okay, now the weather with Ken Gary and the Travels Weather Station. Take wait, Ken. I was there and I couldn't agree with you more too. Just amazing, amazing people. Uh, right now, current conditions at 6 p.m. in Ports, 74 out in Bradley and downtown Hartford, 72 in New Haven and New London and in Bridgeport, Paris 76 is in New York City and Nislip, 79 in Scranton, Pennsylvania, 70 in Newburgh and in Poughkeepsie, 74 out in Albany and in New York, New York, 71 in Springfield, 69 in Worcester, 65 in Boston, 75 in Concord, 69 in Providence, and 79 in Nantucket. But we have to go through a transition getting from here to there. Where I was around the nation today, it was a mostly sunny and a beautiful day today with pleasant weather conditions covered in New York and New England areas yesterday. And today, beautiful weather. Hurricane L crossed the Mexican coast with Texas and northeastern Mexico received up to 15 inches of rain and winds up to 80 miles an hour. Shots and thunder shots dip in the Midwestern states with some snow reported over the higher elevations of the Northwestern states. Sunny, hot weather can but most of the Southwestern states. So forecast for tonight. First guys with no precipitation in the air and a low temperature be about the 50s. For tomorrow, cloudy skies high about 70 degrees with a 10 to 30 percent chance of rain. And tomorrow night, clouds. Those are the ones Zero to 10% chance of rain with a low about 55 degrees and a sunset 7.06 p.m. That is going to be it for the weather. I'm Ken Green at the Charles Weather Station. And now, Ed Anderson in Sports. Take away, Ed. Springfield Carter. So areas a little thank you, thank you very much. This is thank you very much, Ken. Right now, Major League Baseball scores in the National Leagues. New York Mets playing the St. Louis Cardinals 3 to nothing, And with San Francisco 8, Los Angeles 3. Pittsburgh plays the Chicago Cubs 5-4 and Montreal 4, Philadelphia 3. Mark League scores, it was Chicago White Sox 5, Minnesota 3, Oakland 3, Kansas City 2, and Detroit 6, Washington 4. As well as the torrential downpours. If there's a little bit of luck... Saturday's results. College football scores, Army Blank and Holy Cross 26-0, Delaware over Westchester 16-7, Ball State 14, Buffalo 7, Navy 48, Colgate 22, Lafayette 27, East Strasburg 16. And it's out, Clemson Blank and Citadel 24-0, Georgia... Tech 23, South Carolina 20, Villanova 21, Maryland 3, North Carolina over Kentucky 20 to 10, Gremlin 38, Morgan State 21, BMI 13, Furman nothing and Virginia 7, Virginia Tech nothing it was West Virginia 43, William and Mary 7 it was Delaware 39, Westchester 22.
Dead Cage change and the headlines dance up and down. The Mets move from last to first, but Australian tennis players make off with the big money in the American tournaments. This fact was assured today for the second successive year when Ken Roswell and Tony Roach reached the final of the men's singles and the richest of all the tennis tournaments, the 160,000 all United States Open Championships. Before I record, sell out a crowd of 14,041, the two Australian contract professionals registered series set victories and set up the 10th all Australian final in the. Cool, and there's your That's 14 years at the West Side Tennis Club in Four Seals, Queens. By the middle of next week, maybe Wednesday, Thursday, might be heating up all over again. The 35 year old Roswell was played in the semifinals in the National Amateur Championships. Here at Rich was eight, received his first. Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to Gillette Stadium. Five set defeat in the Wimbledon final by beating John Newcomb in the superb exhibition of shot making that mess up forever warm the hearts of the sun drenched spectators at the stadium. The first seeded Roswell beat us. Younger countryman 6-3-6-4-6-3. Roach 25, the runner up to Brad Labor here last year and eliminated America's last top in the men's singles Cliff Ritchie of San Angelo, Texas 6-2-7-6-6-1. The second set was settled by Senate set after a 5 9 point tiebreaker that has delighted crowds and dog players during the success scramble thing this year. Both players have won all their previous Senate F sets. Both Roach served the first, second, and fifth in six points. Ritchie is the third, fourth, and last three. Times by himself. They change offensive coordinators, so I think there's some, some Akron, Ohio. Jack Nicholson won in the game. Millionaire scored a 6 6 day in the World Series of Golf that gave him a three stroke edge toward the first prize at a $50,000. Although this two day 36 hole special for the test of the winners of the golf's four major titles has been held since 1962, no one has been previously been led after the first round at the first round country club by more than one stroke. Second in Nicholas, where the eligibility was based on the victory in the British Open, was Dave Stockton, the Professional Golfers Association title holder with a 69. Although Nicholas been a participant in five times previously, this marks Stockton's debut, and he said he was something what nervous sounded that he just really didn't know what to expect. In Doncaster, England, he was at least 30 lanes back, maybe 50, but it doesn't matter since there was no official charts in English racing, and it didn't it better that Ninjinsky wasn't that far back either. Ninjinsky is a great horse, and only when it's one says that he is the greatest in the argument, but one of the greatest. Yes, look what he did today. He went in 1 3, 1620. Eight St. Lakers, six undefeated, and 10 stairs. He came out undefeated in 11 starts, becoming the first source to sweep the English Triple Crown. Gainesville, Georgia. Vic Gelford won the incredible Triple J, won a grim duel with a once invisible cars of the team. McLaren Saturday to take the pole position in today's Canadian American Challenge Road to Berlin and tomorrow. It was the first time in more than two years that a Canadian Man series that the orange cars of Team McLaren had not held their pole position. They had won the last 19 races of the series. Alfred flown in from England and this week to handle the box like Chapel took the pole with less than an hour remaining to qualify turned in a lap of 117.3 miles an hour. Nearly two miles per hour better than Dennis Holman could manage it in the fastest McLaren MSD. 115 and a half qualified in the third spot was Peter Gedlin and the other team McLaren at guard 114.1 miles per hour. 33 cars are expected to be on line for tomorrow's start but the race was obviously between the McLaren M80s and the long chapel of the latest and Ovation at Texan Gym Hall. In Hartford, the Hartford Knights were the Atlanta Coast breaking out. Even at 1 1, I'm preparing to face the Orlando Pan for Saturday night at Dillon Stadium. Big Knights by runner Mel Meeks of Springfield and pastor Benny Russell steered the Knights to a 27 0 victory over the Jersey Jays in Jersey City Friday night before. 5,000 in Roosevelt Stadium meets carried 22 times for the 100 yards and had touchdowns that runs of 31 and 3 yards. The game also marked the return of the like, last year's starter Tom Morse with 65 yards and 19 carries. Morse was late signing. The events carried full honors in a shutout and former U.S. Master star Steve Rogers was a star with three picks. Russell had an off game and then opened a loss in Naples completed 10 of the 15 passes for 176 yards. He fit wide receiver Bob Storr for a 21 yard touchdown pass in the first period. Tony Kanski, all American safety at Syracuse, now playing a tight end for the Knights, grabbed six passes for 82 yards. And in San Diego, Larry Siegfried for the seven seasons uh, backward standout for the Boston Celtics Friday signed with the San Diego Rockets of the National Basketball Association. Was picked by the expansion Portland Trail Blazers in the draft of the expansion teams last March and was traded down to San Diego. That is going to be it for the 6 o'clock weekend report on Saturday, September 12th, 1970. I'm Peter J. Wiggins with Ed Anderson and Ken Green and the Travels World Station. I hope you have a good evening and coming next will be the CBS Weekend News with Roger Munn. I'll be back for the news at 11. Have a good evening.